Hello everyone and welcome to the new video. Some time ago, I asked Groovy users on Twitter what is their favorite example of using Groovy closures. My goal was to collect some data, process it and write a blog post. 18 people answered to this tweet, but unfortunately I've never wrote any blog post about it. Today I want to get back to this Twitter survey and show you these results. But because I know that many of you are not very familiar with Groovy, so we will start with a very quick introduction to Groovy closures. I will show you by example what the Groovy closure is and how to work with it. Then we will go to the Twitter survey, we will look at the results and we will play around with them in the IDE. And finally, I will share one bonus information with you about Groovy closures. We will dive into many interesting features today and we are starting right now. Let's start with closure definition. A closure in Groovy is an open, anonymous block of code that can take arguments, return a value and be assigned to a variable. A closure may reference variables declared in its surrounding scope. In opposition to the formal definition of a closure, closure in Groovy can also contain free variables which are defined outside of its surrounding scope. Let's define our first closure. Let's say we want to create a closure that and assign it to say hello variable and this closure will just print line hello world, okay? Here we assigned a closure to a variable. That's why you can see we use assign operator. And now if I run this example, nothing happens because closure is just assigned to a variable. And now we need to call it. There are two ways how you can call the closure. So let's say we will use explicit call, which is say hello variable dot call. This is the explicit way to call a closure. But there is also more implicit call and we can simplify it just to say hello and now the syntax looks more like a function call. Let's run this example and see what the output produces. We can see hello world as expected. Now the definition says that closure can take arguments. So let's add a name argument here and instead of hello world we will say hello name. Okay, here I'm using groovy string in a variable interpolation. So I can just put this variable inside double quoted string. This is a groovy string. And now we can pass arguments to those method calls. So here I will say, hello, John. And here I will say, hello, Mary. Let's call it and see what the output is. It says, hello, John and hello, Mary. The documentation also mentions that closure can return a value. So let's say now instead of printing this text, we will return it. We can still use the def keyword, but we can also be more specific and we can specify that say hello is closure of string, this generic parameter, it says what is the returned type of this closure. After making this change, we will need to call print line explicitly here. Let's run this example and let's see how it works. That was is the same, but now this closure returned this hello name. The definition also said that closure can access variables declared in its surrounding, in its environment. Let's define string my name here and I will just use Shimon. And we will change this closure to hello name. My name is my name. Okay. Now we can run this example and you can see that the body of this closure was able to access this my name string. So we have hello John, my name is Shimon and hello Mary, my name is Shimon. But also what we can do is before we call say hello Mary, we can change my name to Shimon Stepniak. Why not? And now you can see that this closure will use modified my name variable. And this time it says, hello, Mari, my name is Shimon Stepniak in this second example. So these are the basics of Groovy closures. For simplicity, you can think about closure as some specific type of function. It's not exactly a function because as you can see here, 
we use say hello variable to store this closure because a closure is an object. That's why it can be stored in a variable. But this is the basic information you need to know to understand more from the upcoming examples. And now we will look at the Twitter survey results. You can find link to this tweet in the description of this video. Kevin says, pre Java 8 it was definitely working with collections. And I couldn't agree more. Let's jump to the IDE and make a few experiments. Let's say we have a list of names. John, Mary, Bob. But also let's say that there are some typos like I don't know. Or someone put cat instead of a name. And something like this. And if you want to process this collection using closures, we could use for instance, find all method. Find all accepts closure. So we could do it like that. Or in Groovy, we can actually get rid of this one. And here we can use a closure as a predicate. So let's say in our case, we want to filter out all values that do not match the following pattern. Here I will use regular expression. And this regular expression accepts only strings that starts with a capital letter and are followed by any lowercase letter. It's a very naive way to test if a given string is a name, but for this demo, let's say it's, it's enough. So here we used it variable. This is the implicit variable that refers to the current element in the iteration, because this find all will iterate the collection. And during this iteration, these elements will be represented by it variable. Of course, we could use named variable, but we will use it later. And we can assign it to some, let's say, result here. We can print the result and see that the final list contains only valid names. But there is much more we can do with it. Let's say, let's say we also want to collect those names, and here we can use a named argument. And let's say we want to transform these names to uppercase, okay? And then let's say we will sort those names by their length, okay? And now we can run this example. And we can see that names are transformed and are sorted in this order. But sorting those names that way is probably not very useful. So what we could do is we could define the comparator differently. We could say that compare length. And if they are equal, we will use Elvis operator here, compare by value. So we will have alphabetical order if the length is equal. So we have the result here. Jorge in his recommendation mentioned each and each with index and we can use these methods here as well. Let's take this result and let's call each method to print line each name. Or if we want to get information about the index, we could use each with index where the first argument is value and the next, the second one is index and we can print line index value. And here's the result. If you are familiar with Java 8 stream API, you are also familiar with this kind of syntax. Of course, stream API and Groovy collections operations, these two things are completely different and Groovy collections operations are not implemented using streams. However, you can see that closures may be used in a context of a predicate or a function. And if we want to implement similar thing using more imperative approach, you see how much more verbose the solution would be and probably how much error prone. And now let's take a look at some functional programming concepts mentioned by Oliver, currying and composition. If you're not familiar with functional programming, you may never heard about currying. Let me show you by example what currying is. Let's say we have 
multiplier closure, a closure that takes two arguments and it just multiplies one by another. Now let's say we want to define doubler closure and it will simply take one argument and it will double the value. And we could implement it like that or we could use the multiplier function and we could carry the first argument. So we will call multiplier carry two. What it does is it creates a new closure by partial application of value two to this multiplier closure. So this one is an equivalent of this one, right? So now we can print line and we can print line doubler, say 10, and we will see 20 printed to the console. Here it is. The composition is another functional programming concept that allows us to define a new function through multiple different functions composition. Let's say we want to define quadrupler. And for that we can use a function composition. So we could compose doubler two times. And here I'm using right shift operator which is a syntactic sugar to something like this and then so first closure takes and it defines how many arguments this quadruple takes in this case it will take one argument it will produce a new value and then it will pass this value to another closure so there's another closure also has to take the same number of arguments right so let's say how it works let's keep it like with the right shift operator and if we print line quadrupler of number four, we should see number number 16 here. In his two tweets, Adam mentions two very interesting examples. The one is using closure identity with with default operation on a map and method pointer that allows us to transform any method into closure. Here's Adam's example where we have a map constructed from some input map. This is a map that contains only a single key Amazon. And we create a new map using with default method where we will define what value should be returned if map does not contain it. So in this case, we use closure identity to return just a key. So if we print line value for the Amazon key, we will get AWS. But if we print line, let's say Google, we will get a Google because there is no value associated with this key. In the second tweet, Adam mentioned method pointer. So let's define a method called something. And let's say this method returns reversed string, for instance. And now we could use a pointer to this method instead of closure identity. So we can use understand something. And what this ampersand operator does, it's, it's create a closure from that method. So now we will get AWS from that map, but we also get reverse name of Google. Dirk in his tweet mentions using closures with regular expressions and especially replace all method. Let's take a look at simple example. Let's say we have a sentence like lorem ipsum dolor sit amet. And let's say we want to create a matcher that matches every first letter of a word. So we will accept capital letters and lowercase letters as well. And now when we find all matching letters, we can call replace all. Here is this match. And we can replace them. Let's say we want to wrap them with square brackets. So what we will do is we will call match. We can use group here and we can transform it to the string. And now we can print line it, of course, here, because without printing, we won't see anything. And here we can see that first letters in these words were wrapped with square brackets as expected. A few people mentioned closure to single abstract method coercion. 
Let's take a look at simple example. Let's say we have an abstract class something with a single abstract method foo. We can create an instance of something through closure to single abstract method coercion. So I can cast this closure to something and I will print line foo. So if we call this foo method here, we will see foo printed to the console. However, there is one thing you need to be aware of. If this abstract class has another abstract method called bar, let's say, and if we call bar method here, you will see that bar method produces the same output. And this is because this closure to single abstract method coercion actually implements every abstract method of a given class. And Renato in his tweet suggested a solution to this problem. So instead of coercing a closure, we can coerce a map of closures where keys are names of methods. So we can use foo to print line foo, and we can use bar key to print line bar. And now when we run this example, we will see foo and bar printed to the console. Of course, this coercion also works with interfaces. So let's say we have a runnable interface and we want to implement it. So we can take runnable, we can cast closure to this interface and we will print line I'm runnable. And if we call this method, we will see I'm runnable printed to the console. Jason in his tweet mentioned carrying and composition, but he also mentioned inject method, which is another operation known to every functional programming enthusiast. So let's say we have a list of numbers from 0 to 20 inclusive. We can call inject method. And this inject method, it takes the initial value, let's say it will be 0, and a closure, which is a function that takes two parameters so-called accumulator and the current value. So if we do something like this, what we produce is a sum of all numbers. Because what this inject does is the following. It takes, it starts with the initial value zero, so accumulator is zero for the first iteration, and it grabs the first element of this collection. It produces a result, and then it passes this result as the value for another iteration. So we can use this mechanism to create a product. So we can start from one, let's say to 10. We will use inject with initial value one. And this time we will multiply accumulator by the number. So if we print line product, we will see a correct product of number 10. Many people in the Twitter survey mentioned closure delegation mechanism. And if you are interested in this specific topic, I strongly encourage you to watch this groovy DSL quick start video where I dive into how you can use delegation to create fluent DSLs. But here, let me show you a very simple example. So if we define a closure like this one, we can call the method, let's say, add one, add two. Of course, this method add does not exist in context of disclosure. However, what we can do next is we can create a list, let it be a, an empty list, and then I can delegate disclosure to that list. And I will use the resolve strategy called, let's say, delegate only or delegate first. Let's use delegate only. And now if I call this closure, and then if I print line this list, we will see that numbers one and two were added to that list. Why? Because this closure delegates its body to its delegate, which means that whenever it finds a method invocation like add, it checks if the current delegate object can invoke those methods, right? So list, of course, has method add, and calling add twice here adds these two values to the list. There are different 
resolve strategies like uh, delegate first or owner first and owner only. So if we change, let's say to owner only, you will see that this code does not work anymore because owner of this closure is a class called closures because here's a groovy script called closures and it generates a class called closures. If I used, let's say, delegate first, then when I invoke those two methods, what Groovy does it ch is it checks if add method belongs to the delegate object. If it does, it invokes this method. Otherwise, it checks if the owner has add method. If you want to learn more about closure delegation mechanism, I strongly encourage you to go and check Groovy DSL Builder's blog post series written by my friend Vladimir Orani. This is a series of 10 blog posts where he compiled his knowledge and experience in building fluent DSLs with Groovy. You can learn a lot from him. Joe in his tweet mentions file each line. Let's take a look at a simple example. Let's create file name in a temp folder from UUID. And let's start with creating that file. And we can create us this file using left shift operator and we can use a multi-line groovy string here. And we can create three random UUIDs. We will trim and then we can call file name each line and we can read every line of that file. So we will just print line line and let's run it and see the output in the console. Georg in his tweet mentions each line method from system input. So you can use this method to read each line of the input. Let's take a look at a quick example. So let's try this each line function. We will get a line and let's say we want to print line, I don't know, like line to uppercase. And now if you run this example, we will see that the program is running. I can type lorem ipsum here and we can see we get uppercased input. Very simple, as you can see. But this is not the only method you can use from the system input. Uh, you can also use it, let's say, like with each byte, where you can read bytes. So in this case, we will see byte values read from the input. So if I type lorem, you will see each character and it represented by its byte value, which in this case is the character code. So these are the results of my Twitter survey. I want to thank everyone who participated in this small experiment. And before we end this video, I want to share one last bonus information with you. If you are not very familiar with Groovy and its history, you may probably not be very impressed by all these fancy functions and closures, because let's be honest, every modern programming language has something very similar. But there is one thing worth mentioning. Groovy was started in 2003, 17 years ago. And these concepts were present in this language from the very beginning. And let me show you that. Here I have a Groovy source code. And if we try to find a commit that contain collect and git commit message, we can track this commit made by James Strahan, the father of Groovy, on September 12, 2003, James here made some changes in default Groovy methods. And if we take a look at this class, we can see that at that time, Groovy was offering each collect, there was find, there was also select, which is funny because select is now known as find all. So. There was some get, immutable, sort. And what's also interesting, I found, I think it was this commit. Here we have closure method test, which is a unit test. And this unit test from 2003, it also casts some light on what the syntax of Groovy looked like in its very early days. So here you can see a closure in the very, very first version of Groovy. 
passed to collect method. So you can see that the parentheses were still required, but there was this vertical line that was separating the variable name from the closure body. There was also this funny operator. It's like a equals operator. It also, this kind of syntax is not valid anymore, but hey, it was like 17 years ago. And now if you think about it, I mean, 2003, that was a year before Java 1.5 was released. The same Java 1.5 that introduced generics and for each loop syntax to the Java programming language. So I think it's safe to say that Groovy was way ahead compared to other programming languages back in 2003, and it was offering many interesting solutions to developers from the day one. If you enjoyed this video, I will be grateful if you could hit that like button and watch the next video from my YouTube channel. If you like my videos and you would like to support my work, there is a link in the description to the page that lists six different ways how to support my blog and YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.